Good morning, church. If we could go ahead and stand as we get ready to worship this morning. Amen. Amen. I mentioned this in the first service. Uh, I, I really am just feeling that the Lord is just wanting us to press in this morning. Press into his presence. And what that means to press in to the presence of the Lord is to uh, enter, this, enter this state of mind that I'm going to surrender everything right now. That I'm not walking out of this place without receiving what it is that the Lord has planned for me to receive this morning. And, and we get to do that in worship. We get to do that when we pray. We get to do that as the word is preached and as we respond to the word as well. And so right now, let's all in one heart in unison begin pressing in together. Amen? So I'm going to ask us if we could just raise our hands right now, raising our hands being just a, a, a posture of surrender and receiving of the Lord. Lord, whatever it is that you have planned, Lord, whatever it is that you have in store, God, whatever it is that uh, will line up according to your will for us to receive today, God, I pray that not one person would leave this building, not one person would tune off from the live stream without receiving what it is that you have in store. And so God, I pray that from the worship to our moments of prayer, to the preaching of the word and our response, Lord, to you from the preaching of the word, Lord, I pray that we would receive all that you have planned, God. And so Lord, we just pray not our will, but let yours be done in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's worship, church. The best is yet to come. Amen? So let's believe God for great things. We have hope in him. The best is yet to come when our hearts are focused on him. Let's sing this together. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward.
So come now, Lord, like never before. Oh, we invite your presence, Lord. Come on, invite his presence in your heart. We want all you have for us, God. We want you like never before. We need you like never before, God. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 When the Spirit of the Lord has a word for a church, there's a personal nature to it. And for those of you that it might seem that's a little strange for somebody to begin to speak up in church that's different than the pastor, how am I supposed to handle that? We recognize that the Scripture gives us guidelines for the manifestations of the Spirit in a church in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14. I, I speak of it often, but if you're new here, you might say, that, that's kind of strange. But what I want you to do is listen to what was being said. Because we take those words, and even though the Spirit comes through human flesh, the Spirit the Scripture tells us that it's capable of error if we don't judge it according to the Word of God. Now, I can tell you today that that word that came today is that we have an abiding God, that we have a God that inhabits the praises of His people, that as we seek Him, that He is the one that fills us, and there was nothing within that word that is not encouraging to the body of believers today. It may very well be that what I'm going to address in the Word when I speak in just a few moments w might not have anything to do with the personal needs or the assurance that you might need today, but the Spirit of the Lord knew exactly what you needed before you got here. And because we come to church not to just go to church, but to encounter God at church, we encounter God at church, our personal God says, I have a message for those that may be questioning, am I there? I have a message for those that may be wondering, are you really know who I am? Do you really know what I'm going through? And today I want you to know he knows you by name. He knows the circumstances of your life and he is there to lead and to guide. Let's encounter God today as we worship, shall we?
your presence in our lives, even when we don't even see you there. Hallelujah. Thank you for your amazing love, God. You know what we need before we even need it.
Just tell him in your own words. Just thank him in your own words. He loves to hear from you. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving me, God. Thank you for making me whole. You're so good, God. You're so faithful, so true. You're so loving, God. We thank you, Lord, for giving your all to us when you came and died on the cross. You took our place, God. You, we were on your minds as you were being tortured and you were hung. God, we thank you that you gave your all for us so willingly. And today, God, our response is that we give our all to you right now, God. How can we hold anything back from a God who gave us his all, who saved us and raised us and calls us his own? Thank you, Lord. We offer our lives to you as a living sacrifice, Lord. Thank you. Yes, 
Yes, Lord. Come on, this is what worship is about. Worship is about surrender. Saying, you are the Lord of my life. I give you control, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Try to identify through the power of the Holy Spirit in your own life what it is that he's asking you to sacrifice now. Maybe what it is that you're holding back from him. Maybe you don't even know God. Maybe you don't even have a relationship with him. Our God is so good. He gives us his all. And in response, we give him our all. And he just pours and pours into our life. But it's so hard sometimes because we want to control it all. But as we release, only then can God really set us free. So I encourage you, maybe make an altar at your seat. Maybe don't sing the words, just think, just pray. Listen for the Holy Spirit. He will show you what it is. Maybe you've been a Christian your whole life, but there's still one thing that you're holding on and you don't want to give him control. So let's sing this again, this verse again. And let's just give our all to God. How can we give anything less? For the one who gave me life, nothing is a sacrifice. Use me how you want to, God. Have your throne within my heart. I hear you call. I am available. I say, 
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands together, church. We exalt thee. We exalt you today, Jesus. We exalt the name that is above every name. Lord, we recognize that your word talks of a time where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And God, I'm so thankful, Lord, to be a part of a body of believers who do not want to wait until that time. But Lord, today, this Sunday, this morning, Lord God, we declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. We worship you, O God. We exalt you, O God. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory today, O God. For, Lord, you are the only one who is worthy to receive it all. It doesn't even belong to anyone else or anything else, O God. It only belongs to you, O Lord. And so, God, we give it to you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, for at times chasing after the created things, Lord God, and giving created things or created beings, Lord, glory and honor that does not belong to them, but only to you, O God. And so I pray, Father, that, Lord, we would turn away from such practices, God, and give it all to you, Jesus. We exalt you today, O God. Father, I, I pray over the many needs that are represented in this place today, God. Lord, whatever they might be, Lord, whether somebody needs a financial miracle today, oh God, maybe somebody today in this very room needs a touch in their very body, Lord. Whatever it is, I'm so thankful that we can call on you as the one who provides. We can call on you as the one who heals. Lord, and as you reminded us today in this, in this worship service, Lord, you are the one who is always with us. Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And so God, we just lay them all down at your feet. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, God. Lord, when we walk through life's greatest trials and situations that we would rather not go through, I'm so thankful that you are right there with us, Lord. And God, you operate in many ways, Lord God. Either you deliver us from those situations or you give us the strength to endure because your grace is sufficient, God. And so, Lord, whatever the needs are, whatever the outcomes may be, not our will, but let yours be done. I pray above all that we could ever seek, we would seek your will, Lord God, as we seek you, Lord. I pray, Father, that, Lord, you would just have your way. Have your way within our hearts, Lord God, and may we find our true contentment in you, Jesus, in knowing you, Lord, in our relationship with you, Jesus. So, God, again, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to die for us. Lord, thank you for sending your son to die for me. God, we love you, and we just pray that you would continue to have your way here at Grace Assembly of God. Lord, and I'm not only talking about this building, Lord, or what happens in this building, God, but have your way in the very hearts of your church, your people. So, Lord, we surrender it all to you, God, and I pray that this time of worship will have prepared our hearts to receive what it is that you have in store for us today in today's word. And so I just pray, God, not our will, but let yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. Good morning, church. All right. Thank you, the ten of you. Good morning, church. Amen. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Pablo Vargas. I have the privilege of serving here at Grace Assembly of God as the youth and family pastor. So I get to say good morning and give you one friendly reminder as our announcements today, because we only have one, which is tonight uh, we will not be having Sunday evening prayer. We usually have Sunday evening prayer from 6 to 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, but tonight it's going to look a little different. Tonight we're going to come together and we're going to uh, hear some information about this gift that has been given to us in that church property over on West Genesee Street. Uh, and uh, here's, here's what we ask of you. Come with open hearts and, and come with dreaming hearts. Amen? Come with dreaming hearts and, and big dreams. I'm talking God-sized dreams of what the Lord could potentially be doing here at Grace Assembly of God as we just talk through some of the potentials that uh, could exist uh, relatively soon as we move forward with life here at Grace Assembly of God. 
Um, and so come with open hearts, come with dreaming hearts, and come ready to just hear all that God is doing here at Grace Assembly of God and all that he could potentially be doing in the days to come as well. And so uh, it's important for us to meet today uh, before Pastor Doug uh, heads away for the summer on his sabbatical so that while he's away, we can be praying together as a body and seeking the will of the Lord for whatever it is that he wants to do with his church. Amen? Amen. Pastor Doug. Thank you. I thought you were going to preach this morning. That sounded like a pretty good outline right there. <laughs> there are times when pastors and churches get accused of only talking about money. Any of you ever heard that from people say, you know, church only talks about money. Today I'm going to talk about money. <laughs> I just thought I would throw that out there right out front just to disclose it all. However, if you attend this church, you know we don't talk about money very often uh, because it's, it's not something that we focus on because we recognize how God works in our lives. But uh, I wanted to, to talk today, especially in light of everything that may be going on in our economy. Are you, is it as loud out there as it is up here for me? Can, can we turn my, my mic down just a little bit? I'd appreciate it. And so today, the, the title of this message is Rich or Poor. And if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me, Father, we have had a marvelous time encountering you in worship. There is something that you work within us when we place ourselves humbly before your lordship in song. We made some declarations today in song that I don't think you're going to let us off the hook for just because it was the lyrics of songs. We sang that heartfelt, Lord, we belong to you. We're grateful to you. Everything that we have in life belongs to you, and we steward it according to your desires. And I pray today that you would take your word and that you would teach us and that from that as we walk in obedience that we, Lord God, would enjoy your presence in a deeper way. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles or your smartphones, whatever it may be that you have, and you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read verse 9. I'm going to read it at the beginning of the message, and then I'm going to bring it back up at the end of the message. And in between, we're going to talk about some things in Scripture that I believe will lead us to have a deeper understanding of this. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, so that you... Now look at your neighbor and say, He's talking about you. Okay, tell him out loud this time. He's talking about you. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. My wife and I have had a running conversation for all the years that we've been married, which will be 40 uh, next month, which is one of the reasons that we're going to be enjoying a 40th anniversary this summer. Thank you. She deserves the applause. That... We can't wait to see what it's going to be like when we stand in heaven because there are certain people that we believe are going to be rewarded so richly for the life that they live and the way that they live that we can't wait to see it. And none of those people that we talk about are pastors. None of them are involved in, in public ministries of any way. In fact, there's a lady that we met a number of years ago, and her name is June. She lives in Long Island, was a part of our church there, and uh, she is... One of the people that we talk about and say, June is going to receive a reward of the Lord that may be bigger than anything we've ever seen. We met June when we moved to Long Island, and she's a generous person, probably the most generous person that I have ever met, and lives in the most humble of circumstances. Uh, June, before she came to know Jesus Christ, grew up in a home where she literally lived in a bar. She said, I would come home from school to do my homework. I would sit behind the bar where my mom and dad would be drinking all day, and I would just do my homework there, and I, that was the environment I grew up in until I met Jesus Christ. She later then married, and her husband was brutally murdered as a taxi driver. Of her four boys, one of them died very unexpectedly as a young adult, and yet in the middle of all of this tragedy and heartache, June remains generous and she remains joyful. In fact, June is the person that was in that church that would volunteer to do the jobs nobody else would volunteer for. And you know the ones I'm talking about when we put up lists and everybody signs up and there's one spot left for cleaning the bathrooms. June would be the one that 
would be the first one there to put her name on those things. In fact, we had a Tuesday morning women's prayer meeting at the church, and, and after the prayer meeting, the ladies would gather together, have some lunch, and then they would spend the rest of the afternoon cleaning the church together, and June would instantly run in and grab the toilet scrubbing brush every Tuesday and would walk around and almost hold it like, a, like it was a torch, you know, just talking about the joy that she has in serving the Lord in all of this. Her smile for life is infectious, and June may even be watching today, so I'm very careful what I say because uh, she keeps track of the things that are happening here. June never complains. She can always be counted on. But June would be considered poor by most of the people in our country. She would be considered to be underprivileged by most of those who look at her and know her. And yet, in the generous spirit that she demonstrated she would always be the first to remember other people. Every child in our church loved June because even though she didn't have much, I don't think there, there was a time when she didn't remember a birthday with a coloring book or something, and the kids would always know her by that. In every situation of life that could have destroyed her faith, she always had a verse when you would say, how are you doing? And she would pull a verse out of the Bible that God was leading her through and sustaining her. And even though today she is battling cancer, she continues to live with a generous spirit. And her theme verse for life is found in Psalm 8410, which says this, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. She has been an example to Cindy and I on how to prioritize generosity and keep things in life, understanding the difference between that which is eternal and that which is temporary. June knows the difference in rich and poor. And the text that I read this morning out of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is kind of a springboard to another passage of Scripture where this is lived out for us. And I would like it, if you would, to turn to Luke chapter 18. It's a passage many of you may already know. But it's an interaction that takes place between Jesus and what is known in the highlight of Scripture as the rich young ruler. And in verse 18, beginning there, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. And then he says this, you know the commands that you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for somebody who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those that heard this asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we have to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will ever fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come in eternal life. We often cite this account of the rich young ruler, but actually it would be more accurate to describe it as a conversation between two rich young rulers in Jesus and the young man. In fact, in this story, Jesus talks about three things that must be considered for us as we're reading the Word of God as it relates to money and generosity. The first one is this. We are warned that there is a danger of money to us spiritually. In verse 24, Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is a metaphor, but it's a metaphor of impossibility. The reason Jesus was using this is the camel would have been the largest land animal that those that were in that area would have been familiar with, and a needle, the eye of the needle, would have been something that would have been so small that they would have understood that this was an example of something that is absolutely impossible. 
But I need you to understand that Jesus is not saying here that it is impossible for rich people to get into heaven because if he was saying that, then we have a problem in Scripture because Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were fabulously rich. If you move into the New Testament, there were numbers of people that were in relationship with Jesus that had wealth, one of them being Joseph of Arimathea, who was a follower of Christ, but it was obviously, according to Scripture, rich. So the point that Jesus is making here is not that rich people should be excluded from heaven or would be excluded from heaven, but when you follow that up with verse 26, it says this, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Notice that he doesn't say what is impossible for rich people, but what he says is what is impossible for all people is possible with God. I want you to understand today, you and I are living miracles if we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The moment that you received him as your Savior and enjoyed the fact that he took your sin and removed them and cast them as far as the east is from the west is the greatest miracle we will ever have within our lives for eternity. You see, the Scripture tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, all have sinned. You can't look around this room and see anybody that is excluded from this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we look at this and say, why then did he pick on the rich here? And here's the answer. Those spiritual things that we all have problems with in our life are accentuated by money. They are made worse by money. Those issues in our lives that make salvation so difficult for us are made worse when money is involved. Therefore, Jesus gives warning about the dangers of money. In fact, for those of you who are Bible studiers, 16 of the 38 parables are about money. Jesus spoke on the topic of money more than he did about heaven and hell combined. There are over 2,000 verses on money in the Bible and only 500 on prayer. In fact, Proverbs has a lot to say about money, how to earn it, how not to be lazy, but he also puts red flags for the believer, for those of us who have Christ as our Savior all around this because he wants us to be warned how easy it is for us to let something take a greater place within our life than it should. Some of the thoughts that Proverbs brings up about money that are red flags to us, he said, money has the power to corrupt people. Money has the power to tempt people toward dishonesty. It can make them ruthless, non-compassionate, uncaring, and suspicious. Money and bribes can distort entire justice systems. And some of the spiritual consequences that Proverbs speaks of as well, number one, money has the power to distract you and to distract me from what is really important. Proverbs 11.4 says, Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. How many of you know money can make you busy? Money can make you busy. You can be frantically busy trying to make money. You can be frantically busy trying to sustain it. And what you buy with it can make you even busier. How many of you bought a fixer-upper? And there goes your life. <laughs> many of you understand that. I had a conversation with a man in a church that uh, I pastored in Long Island at one time, and he had come from very humble beginnings, had a great business mind, and began to develop a business as an entrepreneur that became very, very successful. We discovered that the more successful he got, the less we began to see him in church. The more successful he got, the things that he was able to buy began to draw him away. And the more successful that he got, the less that he began to be involved in the things of the Lord until God finally got a hold of his heart and asked him the question, what are you really accomplishing in life that will last beyond your life here? And at that point, he recommitted himself to the Lord and readjusted his priorities. And he later told me, he goes, I did not realize how easy the trap of success would be to fall into. I did not realize, realize how easy it would be to snag by that. You see, making money 
seems really, really important until the time comes when it's not. I have had the opportunity through the years of ministry to sit by the bedside of many who were taking their last breath. I have never, ever had anybody tell me, I wish I had spent more time at the office as their last words. Nobody. But I have had many people tell me, as life on this earth was growing short for them, that they recognized that they had prioritized the wrong things and were suffering the consequences in their last days because they had been distracted and never developed character, never developed love and the relationships that God had provided around them the way they should have. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. And that means, yes, that when you die, your wealth, the, the wealth that you have will not be able to be saved. You can't take it with you. We know all of those things. But there's more meaning to it than just that. One of the deep disillusions that money can cause us is this. It will make you falsely believe that you are safe when you are not. It will make you believe that you are safe when you are not. It can falsely make you believe that you are insulated from harm when you are not. It will falsely make you believe that you can rest and relax because of what you've accumulated when you can't. And money can easily give you a false sense of security. And the reason that we know these things is because money cannot exclude you from heartache Money cannot exclude you from death, and when you face, when you face the hardships of life, in relational betrayal, or in grief, or in dire illness, or unexpected financial disasters, you will be incredibly vulnerable because you will not have been able to develop the character and the faith that you need because you will have put your hope in something that was never intended to sustain you. Money can't stop death, money cannot stop tragedy, and money cannot stop heartbreak. And if you have built yourself up that this is your security and that this is your safety net, you will find a time in life when it will be worthless as everything you've built it up to be. Money also distorts your ability to view yourself properly. Proverbs 30, verse 8, at the end of it, it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I might have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Money can make you think that what you've accomplished you did on your own. Money can make you think as if God had nothing to do with whatever it was in your life that brought you to success to the point where at moments in time, being successful, you, you can look back and say, who is the Lord? Really, it's, it's me that has done this. It's my work ethic. It's my ability that has done all this. And we can dismiss the value of what God has done and given to us. Money can cause pride that leads one to trust their intuition over the direction of the Holy Spirit. Money can distort your view of yourself so that you will choose a career badly because you didn't choose it based on the direction of God. You chose it on what can I get out of it. Can I just give a warning to parents now? We're in graduation season. High school graduates, college graduates, all of them, do you know that many of those kids, when they were interviewed in college and said, why did you choose what you did? Most of them, at one point or another, said something to the effect of, my mom and dad wanted me to make a great living. And begin to counsel them as it relates to their life, their skills, their ability, and the fact that don't do something that you're not going to be able to provide well for. Parents, please. Please allow your children that are being raised under the care of God to understand that God may have a passion and a power and a direction for their life that does not include earning potential more than the will of God for your children. Money can cause you to make terrible decisions about who to marry. Wealth can take your humility away. By virtue of an office that I served in before I was the pastor of this church, I sat on the board of trustees of two of our Assembly of God colleges. 
I was on the finance committee of one of those colleges, and we had an individual that came in that was a very wealthy businessman, came and sat down with us as the board of trustees and looked around the room as he sees us, and he said, I have a lot of resources, and I want to interview each of you to make sure that you are worthy of my money. I remember sitting there in that meeting thinking, I don't know if I have ever heard a more arrogant person in my entire life, but I had sat in the room of somebody who their wealth had taken their humility away. Wealth can blind you to how important money has become to you. And when you are confronted with it, if you can't admit to yourself how important it is, then you need to understand that that is the nature of addiction. And we live in a nation that is addicted to the wrong things. There is the danger of money, but... It doesn't have to be dangerous, but it can become so very, very easily. So why then is Jesus pointing out that money can become so dangerous to us spiritually? Why does money have this incredible power over people? Well, in the chapter that we just read in Luke chapter 18 and verses 18 through 21, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And the young man answered this way, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, for those of us that study the word, these are shocking words from Jesus. And I'll tell you why. This man approached Jesus and said to him, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus tells him, be good. If you'll just be good, you can have eternal life. If you just obey the commandments, you can have eternal life. This is shocking because this is the only time Jesus ever talks about this. It's the only time he's ever done this. In fact, if you read the entire 18th chapter, there's a fascinating thing that takes place right before this where a Pharisee in prayer standing before everybody begins to brag about how good he is. And publicly, he's declaring everything that Jesus just said, I obey the commands. And then he looks around to see how many are watching him. I tithe 10%. Oh, God, I'm so glad you made me good in comparison to all of these around me. If obeying the commands made one good, then the Pharisee would have been right in his prayer. And so we look at this and say, why then... Did Jesus use this wording with this young man at this particular time? Interesting enough, there was a tax collector that was also there at this prayer time. And he was completely humiliated by the prayer of the Pharisee. And he bows his head down and he declares, Lord, I'm here because I need mercy. And Jesus condemns the Pharisee for going home not saved and praised the tax collector for his humility, and he went home saved. So Jesus tells us over and over again, you cannot earn your salvation by your goodness. You cannot earn your ability to get into heaven by just your good behavior. So when he tells this rich young ruler, obey the commandments, we look at that and go, how can he do that? And what's Jesus doing here? The answer to that is that Jesus is a wonderful counselor. He knows us individually. He knows the uniqueness of each person, and he knows the uniqueness of how to reach each person. He knows the key to our heart is as unique as the keys to your homes. One key won't fit every lock. Knowing this, he addresses this rich young ruler in a very individual way. And the reason that Jesus did not explain the plan of salvation to this rich young ruler is because the young man didn't think he had a problem. If Jesus had told him, I have come to take care of your sin, I've come to die on the cross for you because you've got this sin problem, the young man would have looked at him and said, what problem are you talking about? I don't have a sin problem. And this is evident by the way that he responds to Jesus when he said, All of these, all of these things that you just mentioned, I already do. I'm good. I am good. I've been good for a long time. 
I've been good since I was a little boy. I'd love to talk to his mother. <laughs> Interesting enough, this same attitude infects our culture today. Tim Keller writes of a British journalist named Polly Toynbee, and she is not a Christian. In fact, she often writes for her absolute disdain of Christianity. And she wrote this, Of all of the elements of Christianity, the most repugnant is the notion that Christ took our sin upon himself, sacrificed his body in agony to save our souls. Did I ask him to do that? You see, here's her point. She is saying, I am offended, Jesus, when you tell me that you want to be my Savior, when you tell me that I somehow need a Savior. I didn't ask you to do that for me. And what makes you think I need a Savior? What makes you think I need rescued? Because I am fine. I am good. I did not need you to pay for my sin because I'm good. I'm good. Sounds just like that rich young ruler. In fact, that's exactly what that young man would have said to Jesus. But Jesus, in the ability that he has to read people, perceives that this young man is not as secure as he thinks he is because he understands that if he was, he would never have come and asked that question in the first place. Here's the issue for people that believe that their goodness and the good way that I treat people, the good things that I do, the, the way that I am honorable and the way that I do things is going to earn for me a place in heaven. Here's the problem. You never know what the hurdle is to be good enough. You will always live in a sense of insecurity because even though you are thinking, I measure up better than 50% of the world, so I must be on the good side of the judgment, you're never sure. And that's what Jesus said, I've come to make you sure, and it has nothing to do with your goodness. And so Jesus looks at him and says, okay, you think you're good? You still lack one thing. Sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And again, we look at this, and frankly, we are shocked at the way Jesus says that because he has never, ever told anybody else in Scripture that if they would just give away all their money and give it to the poor, that they would be saved. It's a brand new thing that he's introducing here. So why is Jesus doing that? Because it is brilliant both personally and theologically in the life of this young man. The personal strategy is this. I want you to remember back to a situation where Jesus in John chapter 4 is going to a well and he meets a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman. Many of you remember that. And he sits down with her and he begins to have a conversation with her. And he begins to talk to her and he said, would you give me some water? And she said, yeah. And then he begins to talk to her about living water. And in the middle of that conversation, he begins to point out to her the fact that she is not married, has had a number of men in her life, recognizing that to her, men had been her living water. Men had been her security. Jesus doesn't bring up money to her because money wasn't her issue. He doesn't bring up sex and romance and relationships to the rich young ruler because that wasn't his issue. Jesus brings up money because to the rich young ruler, money had become his living water. So Jesus challenges his support system of money. And the rich young ruler was stood, standing there listening to Jesus suddenly has to come face to face with the recognition that money had been his scorecard, money had been his identity, money had been his security, and for some reason it had been the reason that God and a relationship with God has been squeezed out of his life and faced with the opportunity to be obedient chose the fake security of money over the real security of Jesus. Craig Groeschel said this, so often the difference between where we are and the unbelievable blessings God wants to lead us to is the pain that we are unwilling to bear to be obedient. Think about that. The difference often between where we are and the unbelievable blessings that God wants to lead us to is the pain that we are unwilling to bear to be obedient. And so it was a personal strategy with this young man. But there was also a theological strategy to it. 
The young man had told Jesus, all of these things that you just mentioned, I've kept since I was a kid. I have obeyed all these things, and so by, your, by virtue of what you have just presented to me, I am saved already. I should be good. And so Jesus looked at him and said, let me challenge your answer just a little bit. Since you think in your mind you've done all these things and that you're good, you follow all the commandments, let me just start with the first one. Because in Exodus 23, it says, there shall be no other God before me. No other God before me. So before we get to the other nine commandments, young man, let's just look at this first one. Can you even conceive of giving all of your money away? Are you willing to give it away, give the money to the poor, and follow me and let me be your provision? Can you even conceive of that? And his response in verse 23 says this. When he heard this, he became very sad. That term, very sad, is an understatement. It was deeply, deeply distressed because suddenly he has been confronted with the fact that he is no, not who he says he is at all because he had very great wealth. The reason he's sad is because money isn't just money to him. It's what men were to the woman at the well. And in the end, there are many that will say, and I'm speaking this to an American church, there are many that will say, I want God in my life just as long as he doesn't get in the way of this. Because money matters to me more than a committed relationship with my God. And theologically, Jesus showed the young man that he had not obeyed all the commandments. He couldn't even get past the first one and that he was not who he said he was. Here's what happens. Money becomes a false savior to us. We begin to believe that whatever we have accumulated is going to insulate us from all the difficulties. Let me tell you something. Your money will not take your sin away. Only Jesus can do that. And the spiritual power that money has in our life is when it sets itself up or we allow it to set itself up as something with more power than it really has. And we put our trust in it more than we put our trust in God. And so I conclude with this thought. How can we escape the danger? How can we make sure that money and the power of money does not become distorted within our lives? Three quick action points. Worship team, if you'd please come. Number one, all of us need to assume that we're in denial. We all just need to assume that we think way more of it than we should. When Jesus looked at him and says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for rich people to get into heaven, it was a slap in the face to this kid. It yanked him to the reality of what was really going on. It caught him off guard. It shook him up. And it told the young man, you are living in denial about everything. I believe that there are times in our life when God needs to shake us up just a little bit like he may be doing today. We need to assume some things about ourselves, that we are in denial, denial about how important money really is to us, or that the amount of money that you think you need is different than what you really need, or that the amount of money that you think you can give away is less than what you can really give away. We need to assume that we live under an undue pressure of the power of money within our lives. Secondly, action step is we need to remember the rich young ruler. What can we learn from him? Don't ever forget that after this encounter, the rich young ruler went away and was not saved. I thought about him this week, and I wonder what eternity is like for him and how many times in punishment he has relived that conversation when suddenly now money doesn't matter. At faced with the opportunity, he chose poorly. When presented with an opportunity, he chose wrong. He makes a choice that what he has and what others think of him is a better savior than Jesus. And he believes that his wealth and position and his possessions will bring him greater joy than a relationship with God. But here's the power of the story. It comes in the contrast. I mentioned to you earlier that this is a story about two rich young rulers. Jesus is standing there talking to this young man, having been the richest young ruler in the universe. He has it all. 
the power of heaven and the glory of heaven, the power of every provision, things we can't even think of, and he gave it all up to come to be incarnate, to live among us, to lower himself to come where we are so that through his poverty he might bring us to places of riches in him. You see, he came to the sinful and the undeserving. He gave everything he had for those of us who were poor in our sin. Even those he came to love that would never expect it or never receive it, would never appreciate it or never say a good word about him. Jesus didn't tithe his blood. He gave it all. And so back to the text that we launched with in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sake, sold it all gave it to the poor to come and reach us so that you through his poverty might be rich the benefit of his sacrifice is great joy in our heart joy within our heart and when we realize that the joy of the Lord drains power from money it becomes just money it becomes just a tool it no longer is your savior. It no longer is your security, which leads us then to the last action step of have a plan. Ask yourself, how much of my wealth am I giving away? If it's not 10%, which is the tithe of the Old Testament, and by the way, 10% is the floor in the New Testament. I'll probably get to that next week. If you're not there, then you need to ask yourself, what do I need to do in my life to aggressively achieve moving to that 10%. Figure out what sacrifices you're going to have to make in order to get there because I can tell you that some of the happiest and joyful people I know have changed their lifestyle in order to reformulate the priorities of their life to make sure that their Savior was more important than their money. That's why he comes back and says, God loves a cheerful giver because we put money in its place and we've elevated him to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Stand with me, please. I want to invite our altar workers to please make their way to the front to be prepared to pray with people. I recognize that some of you today may be sitting here and you're going, you know, I don't know if I have the courage to do that. Can I just tell you, it's, it's not courage you need, it's joy. The joy of the Lord begins to open up our hearts to levels of generosity. I believe that if you want more joy in your life, then take a look at the riches that are yours through Christ Jesus. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, if you've never personally invited Him to come into your life, to be your director, your guide, 
then today, I, before you leave today, would you come up and just have somebody pray with you and tell them, I'm here to meet Jesus. I, I just need to meet Jesus today. We've been praying for you. Every one of us that are here have made that same step. And we would love to introduce you to Jesus. If you're here today and maybe there's some needs that you need healing in or direction in, then please make yourself available to be prayed for today. I pray that the theme of the message is something that settles within our heart. Lord, in the middle of a, a day and age when we look around our nation and, and it gets so easy to be frightened of everything that's happening in the economy and how much money we lose in, in retirement and all of these things and the prices, that, Lord, that we would remember <laughs> you are our provision. You are our provision. And you're worth more than everything. And that relationship with you is what brings us joy. So, Father, today we pray. Would you help us realign priorities? Would you allow us to think and act in such a way that all of the red flags that you build around money, riches, self-sufficiency, all those red flags would be something that would be meaningful to us as we reprioritize our life to the place where you are our all in all and money is simply a tool. And as we do that, the resulting joy of generous spirits and cheerfulness that enters our life will come as a recognition that you truly are our God, our Savior, and our provision. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. I pray that you will have a marvelous day in the Lord. And again, if you're here today and would like to be introduced to Jesus, would you please come? Want somebody to pray with you? Please come. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. And I'll look forward to seeing most of you tonight when we come back and talk about a gift that God has given us.